computer security receives a great deal of attention in the news. But when we design cyber physical systems and Internet of Things systems, we have to worry about both safety and security. These two characteristics cannot be separated when we use computers to control real world objects. Security in computer systems refers to information. The integrity of the, that information, making sure that the information doesn't change when we don't want it to, and confidentiality, making sure that people who should not have access to the information don't get it. Safety is typically apply to engineering systems. Think of it as the release of energy. When something good happens, we control the energy of the system appropriately. When something bad happens, the energy is released in the wrong way. Traditionally, safety and security are handled by very different groups of people in engineering design. Safety engineering is a separate discipline. Security is a discipline inside computer science. These two fields have rarely talked to each other. However, now that we're building cyber physical systems and IoT systems, safety and security are intimately related and we can no longer treat them as separate subjects. We have to come up with unified techniques that make sure that the systems we design are both safe and secure because we cannot have one without the other. Remember that complex cyber physical systems are everywhere. The Ford F-150, which is the most popular vehicle in America, ships with 150 million lines of code. The Boeing 787 airliner ships with a smaller amount of code, 7 million. However, that's because Boeing has made a great deal of effort to ensure that redundant code is not present in the aircraft. Remember also that aircraft designs, including their software, are certified and must be approved by a certification authority. In most countries, car design is not subject to the same level of scrutiny. We need a model for safety and security, and this model has to encompass the coupling of the cyber components and the physical components. So changes to the computational system can change the state of the physical plant, the physical system that we're controlling. The arrow goes the other way. Changes to the physical plant can change the computational state. So now we have an interconnected system. And we have to remember that safety and security depend not just on values, but on timing. And this is a big difference from the traditional information-centric view of security. When controlling a real-time system, merely delaying the input can be enough to cause a significant safety problem. Think of your brakes. If there's a delay from when you hit the brake pedal to when the brakes start to engage, the car doesn't stop when you think it should. So we have a lot of different types of attacks, which we'll go through in more detail. Attacks on timing and quality of service that relate to the time at which information occurs. We can also uh, worry about Trojan horses, that is, elements that are designed into the system to be exploited later by attackers. We also have a number of design flaws, which are generally inadvertent, but in, occasionally, like Trojan horses, these are deliberate. These design flaws are challenging because we have nonlinear systems that we're controlling numerically. They have complex state. So these are very difficult to design. They're also very difficult to verify, particularly when subsystems of the design are black boxes. When we build complex systems like automobiles, aircraft, industrial control, we don't build everything from scratch. We use components and we don't always have insight into what's inside all of those components. Information technology security says systems should be updated frequently. That doesn't apply to cyber physical systems because we can't just stop these physical plants whenever we want to. We can't update a running system that's under direct control of a computer system. We need to stop the operation, perform the update, and then continue. But remember that complex systems can't always be stopped when we want to. We can't stop an airplane in mid-flight. Electrical systems, chemical plants can take hours first to shut down and then to bring back up to full operation. So stopping a system for a computer upgrade has a large cost. It's also true that updates may fix some problems but introduce others. And remember that these cyber-physical systems are designed for lifetimes of decades. 
typical fast replacement cycle that we've seen in desktop computers doesn't apply to cyber physical systems. So we need to be able to replace components after a long period of operation and we need to be able to upgrade the system seamlessly. So some of the challenges in safety and security are due simply to the complexity of the system. Others are due specifically to connections to the internet. We've seen a number of attacks on cyber physical systems. A Stuxnet attack on the Iranian nuclear facilities extended over many years and caused significant damage. The Ukraine power grid was attacked in 2016, causing a loss of service to many customers. There are reports that a United Airlines 737 was hacked in flight in 2015. No damage was caused, but this is a very concerning event. We've also seen problems due to design flaws. An Airbus 400M crashed, killing its crew in 2015 due to a bug in the fuel system software. The Dieselgate affair for Volkswagen cars was caused by a deliberate design flaw to mask the emissions characteristics of the vehicles. Now, victims who are inconvenienced, hurt, or killed don't usually distinguish much between design flaws and attacks. They're both bad. When bad things happen, people are concerned. It is true that attacks have a somewhat different dynamic because the attacker can see what we do to respond to them and adapt their behavior based on what they observe in us. So we need to have a longer term, more robust, more dynamic plan for attackers. But there are many common features that we can use to mitigate both attacks and design flaws. Prior to 2014, common wisdom held that open source software was better in many ways, including security, and was proprietary software. People claimed that open source software had more eyes on it, more people looking at the code, and therefore flaws would be discovered quicker and fixed more quickly. The Heartbleed bug proved that this is not the case. Heartbleed was a security vulnerability in OpenSSL, a critical component of internet software. It was due to a missing bounds check. This bug was introduced in 2012 and publicly disclosed in April 2014. So here we have a major vulnerability in a critical piece of software that was produced by open source. And as it turns out, not that many people actually looked at the code. Only a small group of people actually dealt with this code, and they missed this bug for several years. Pundits have also claimed that air gaps can be used to protect internet systems in general and cybernet. People have also claimed that air gaps can be used to protect internet systems of all types and cyber physical systems. An air gap is a system that is not connected to the internet. These are widely used in safety critical systems because people believe that they protect against internet vulnerabilities. However, it's difficult to impossible to maintain air gaps in practice. We've seen air gaps exploited in at least one instance. Stuxnet was introduced into the Iranian nuclear facilities through USB keys that were used by contractors to move their software into the facility. Those USB keys were infected outside the facility and caused the infection to move inside the facility. The Nuclear Energy Institute of Great Britain conducted a study on air gaps, particularly in nuclear energy facilities. First, they found that maintenance workers introduce temporary internet connections commonly. Of course, even a temporary internet connection breaks the air gap and provides the opportunity to infect the system. But worse, they found that these supposedly temporary interconnections were not always taken down at the end of the maintenance and so could be left up for months or years, leaving the nuclear facility prone to all sorts of attacks and infections. We've also traditionally assumed that cyber-physical systems are kept separate from the information technology systems that are used in the rest of corporations. Information technology is used for billing, for personnel, for all sorts of non-timing related, non-physical related systems. However, in many cases, these systems are actually linked. IT systems provide operational support to cyber-physical systems. For example, in May 2015, IT failures that were unrelated at three different U.S. airlines grounded flights. 
That's because the dispatchers who control the operation of the aircraft and are required by FAA regulation use IT systems. So the failure of the IT system caused operational problems in the aircrafts in flight. Traditional system design uses the V model to represent the design process. The V has a downward slope for the implementation phase when we go from system to component. It then moves back up the levels of abstraction from component to system to validate that the implementation meets the requirements and specifications. But the V model assumes that the system requirements don't change and the components have known properties. But in the internet era, when we have a system that is even intermittently connected to the internet, the threats change over time. We don't have a golden reference for what threats the system needs to be able to withstand. We need to be able to update the system even after deployment. Furthermore, the subsystems themselves are not always known. They're often black boxes they can exhibit unexpected behavior and they can be infected even after system deployment. So we need both design time and runtime techniques to make sure that our systems, we need to use both design time and runtime techniques to make sure that our cyber physical and IoT systems are both safe and secure. Model-based design is now widely used for cyber physical designs. It's a compositional method that uses models of the cyber plant and the physical plant. It supports both verification and simulation and it provides a synthesis path for the software implementation. Service-oriented architectures are widely used in the internet to provide transactional services, but cyber-physical and IoT systems require longer running services and they require quality of service. So we can develop new architectures for services designed specifically for cyber-physical systems. System synthesis allows us to create implementations with known properties from high-level specifications. We can be concerned about hardware trojans that are introduced at various levels of design, integrated circuits or subsystems, and we can take measures at design time to look for them and, and mitigate them. Fuzz testing is a way to generate tests for systems that more thoroughly explore the design space. And fuzz testing has been used in industrial control and other types of cyber-physical systems. Runtime techniques include monitors, checking the system state in the environment and making sure that certain properties are in place. Structural health monitoring is used in civil engineering to monitor buildings, bridges, other large structures. Diagnosis helps us identify the root cause of problems, which we can then use to determine what to do. Secure protocols are needed to ensure the integrity of information at runtime and to ensure that software updates are valid. Fingerprinting allows us to identify the characteristics of devices at runtime and ensure that they are properly configured. To summarize, safety and security have traditionally been considered separate design tasks done by different people. But in today's world in which we use computers to control real world objects, that's no longer sufficient. We must treat safety and security together. Many of our traditional assumptions about both safety and security are inadequate for this new world of cyber-physical and IoT systems. We need to apply best practices in both traditional safety and security. We also need to develop new methods for both design time and runtime to ensure that our cyber-physical and IoT systems are safe and secure.